Paleontology, a fascinating field populated by such heavy hitters as Alan Grant, Tommy Oliver, and Ross Geller, as well as some real people. Many real people, myself included, are captivated by the field of paleontology, and many of those people have YouTube channels. Organized by Expeditioners Discovery Enterprise Guild, or EDGE, these channels come together for an annual presentation that covers the year's most notable discoveries in the endlessly intriguing field of paleontology. It's called Paleo Rewind, and this year, I am honored to be a part of it. Now, normally, I cover speculative biology, but as you might have seen in some of my previous videos, the line between speculation and reality is often blurred, and the truth is often deeply embedded in fiction. And so today, I'll be covering some interesting paleontological finds for the month of March, but be sure to check out the channels in the description for the other months of 2022, which are released on their respective channels daily, all culminating in a complete compilation set to release on Edge's channel on January 1st. Now, dear traveler, climb on board as we begin a journey back in time. Have you ever heard of a Margosaurus? Weighing between 3 and 4 tons and measuring up to 43 feet, or 13 meters, it's considered small, for a sauropod anyway. It also has a relatively small neck for its body, again when compared to other sauropods. But what makes this particular dinosaur so recognizable are its extremely tall, upwardly projecting neural spines on the neck and anterior dorsal vertebrae. Portions of these spines were bifurcated, meaning simply that they formed a double row. Also important to note is that these spines are circular in cross-section and tapered toward their tips. Ever since the first and only skeleton was discovered in 1984, scientists have debated the exact function of these spines. In 1991, Salgado and Bonaparte suggested that, due to their tapered tips, perhaps the spines were used for defense. This makes sense, especially because when Amargosaurus lowered its head, the spines pointed forward. Other scientists argued that they were used solely for sexual display or to intimidate rivals. You know, the usual stuff. Artwork has often depicted Amargosaurus with a large sail, much like Spinosaurus or Dimetrodon. The fact that the spines were bifurcated led some artwork to show them with two sails, though even this was debated. Some scientists, such as Gregory Paul, thought that any sails were unlikely, however, as they would have reduced neck flexion and that the spines were circular in cross-section rather than flattened, as is the case in sail-bearing animals. He proposed that this circular shape was more indicative of supporting a keratinous sheath that, in life, would have extended the length of the spines. He also hypothesized that the spines could have been clattered together to generate sound. Still others suggested that perhaps the spine supported a fleshy hump, much like an American bison. And so the debates raged on undoubtedly devolving into fistfights more often than not. But this year, a study published in the Journal of Anatomy sought to settle the argument once and for all, or at least provide some evidence. In this study, called Osteohistology of the Hyper-Elongate Hemispinous Processes of Amargosaurus Kazawi, Dinosauria sauropoda, Implications for Soft Tissue Reconstruction and Functional Significance, a group of scientists analyzed for the first time external morphology, internal microanatomy, and bone microstructure of the hemispinous processes and compared them to another similar species from the same region. The study revealed highly vascularized fibrolamellar bone interrupted by cyclical growth marks, as well as secondary remodeling, evidenced by the presence of abundant secondary osteons irregularly distributed within the cortex. What does all this mean exactly? Well, for one, contrary to popular thought, both anatomical and histological evidence revealed by the study indicate that Amargosaurus's spines didn't have a keratinized sheath, also known as a horn. Not only that, but the presence of specifically oriented Sharpies fibers seem to indicate that the spines were connected by ligaments. In short, the data this study uncovered strongly indicates that rather than a hump or standalone horns, Amargosaurus did indeed have a cervical sail. This is also likely true of other species in its family, giving us some fascinating insight into how these creatures looked. Now we just have to figure out what the sail was for. Near the eastern coast of Brazil lies an unassuming cave, little more than a hole in the ground. If you walked by it, perhaps on a midday stroll, you may not even notice it at all, but this cave conceals a wealth of dead creatures dating back millennia. In fact, the Toca das Onças site, as it's called, is considered one of the richest paleontological sites of the Brazilian Quaternary. Why? Well, simply put, it's because many prehistoric creatures met their demise in this cave. Two hypotheses have been proposed as to the large number of bones found here. First is that many animals climbed down the vertical shaft looking for water, but found themselves trapped. The second is even more simple. Due to the vertical character of the cave entrance, it acted as a natural trap. 
Among the remains found here are two complete skeletons of Arimotherium lorillardi, a giant ground sloth which went extinct in the early Holocene. Now, we can learn a lot about extinct animals from the age, composition, and structure of their bones, like when they indicate that a certain sauropod likely had a sail instead of horns. But bones can also shed light on the daily lives of these creatures. By studying bone trauma, scientists can determine predator-prey relationships, lifestyles, behaviors, and myriad other things. The scientist behind a study published in Nature asked the question, what could the bones of Arimotherium lorillardi found in this cave tell us about how these majestic beasts actually died? The team investigated three vertebrae found there, two thoracic and one lumbar, which belong to the same individual and have similar lesions. All lesions were found to be in the caudal end plate of each vertebrae. To rule out damage and preservation, the researchers noted clear signs of osteoblastic activity indicative of a fracture in living bone. Specifically, the fractures were classified as vertebral body compression with sagittal split fractures, which implies that this particular traumatic episode was likely caused by compressive force on the vertebral column. Interestingly, similar compression fractures can appear in human bones, usually caused by osteoporosis. But since their study found no other indications of disease, a similar cause for the E. lorillardi bones were ruled out. But do you know what else causes compression fractures? That's right, falls from a great height. The entrance to this particular cave drops nearly 15 feet straight down, so it stands to reason that perhaps the poor E. Lorillardi was climbing down into the cave and fell. But this seems unlikely, as the study notes that this species wasn't known to be a climber. Sadly, it seems that the cave did indeed act as a kind of natural trap into which at least two large Arimotherium Lorillardi fell to their doom, where they would remain for thousands of years. This is exactly the kind of slice-of-life insight that can be gleaned from what would, at first glance, seem to be nothing more than inert fossils. As someone who grew up loving Tyrannosaurus rex, and really, who didn't, I'm always surprised and fascinated when new evidence gives us new insight into these amazing creatures' appearance, behavior, and physiology. One of the more interesting contributions to our understanding of T-Rex came in the form of a study published on March 1st in Evolutionary Biology. In it, a scientist by the name of Gregory Paul, who we introduced earlier with the Amargosaurus segment, and a few of his colleagues, makes the not insubstantial claim that the traditional idea of a T-Rex actually represents three species. There is, of course, the iconic Tyrannosaurus rex itself, but they argue the addition of two additional, equally awesomely named species, Tyrannosaurus imperator and Tyrannosaurus regina. Now, there has been contention as to which species are actually Tyrannosaurus rex and which might be separate species for some time. Nanotyrannus comes to mind, and it's now nearly universally thought to be simply a juvenile T. rex. What makes this study controversial, though, are its bold claims, which are based on what some would call not enough evidence. The study analyzed three aspects of 37 T. rex specimens, dentition, the length and circumference of thigh bones, and overall robustness ruling out possible explanations like age, overall size, and sexual dimorphism, and relying on additional evidence provided by the location and sediment layers wherein these bones were found, the team concluded that even our most popular T. rex skeletons actually belong to separate species. The famous Sioux specimen, they argue, is actually the holotype of Tyrannosaurus imperator, while the Wankel T. rex is the holotype of Tyrannosaurus regina. This is obviously a simplification of the study, and by the way, all links can be found in the description if you want to dive deeper. But since the paper was published, many, many experts and scientists have disagreed with the conclusions drawn by the study's authors. For one, the sample size of 38 specimens is too small to draw consistent lines between species, as many supposed differences, including dentition and femur size, could easily be accounted for by simple variations between individuals. Of course, speciation over the course of time which T. rex roamed the earth isn't a far-fetched idea, but many argue simply that the data provided by this study is hardly enough to be conclusive. Some people also question the study's lack of clarity in assigning certain well-preserved species to a particular category. Ultimately, the study remains in some contention, and only time and more bones will tell who will be vindicated. And so we've come to the end of my segment. If you're watching this on release day, make sure to check out the next video in the series, which will be featured tomorrow on Gutsick Gibbon's channel and all the other awesome creators involved in Paleo Rewind 2022. As always, thanks for watching, and remember, you matter.